Piracy has been a major problem in the South China Sea for hundreds of years and it continues to be so. It has been big business since Cheng He formed his pirate navy in the late 1700s and then his wife Ching Shi continuing to run and expand it in the early 1800s. But how difficult is it to steal a ship or its cargo in the modern age? Well, here's some tips on how to steal a ship and a couple of case studies that hint at connivance at official level. It should be hard in the modern age for a 12,000 tonne cargo ship loaded to the gunnels with furnace slag no less to disappear from the face of the earth. But that's exactly what happened to the MV Chung Son, a Panama flagged boat carrier as it piled through a slow swell in the South China Sea about 200 miles east of Hong Kong in November 1998. It didn't vanish, of course. It was shipjacked by pirates who bound and gagged the 23-men crew and shot them. Their bodies were weighted, dumped overboard, and later six bodies were recovered in fishing nets, which is how we know what happened to them. Of the ship and its cargo, there was and is no trace. The probability is that it was given a new identity with the collusion of corrupt officials, and it may still be sailing. Though although initially an anti-collision tool, it was partly due to such disappearances that the Automatic Identification System, or AIS, was made compulsory in 2004 for vessels over 300 tonnes. A transponder had to be fitted and carried to continually broadcast the position of the vessel. And it obviously works something like an air traffic control system, each vessel sending a 26 millisecond pulse to satellites every minute to confirm its position. Here's a screen capture of AIS that I took in December 2019 when putting this talk together. Every coloured icon is a vessel. Here's the key. Mouse over any icon and its name, registry and destination is revealed. Click again and more information is shown. This is Pacific Qingdao, an LPG tanker, and from this we can see its time and date of departure and its ETA at its designated port. We can also see its speed and course being steered. This is a crowded sea. One third of the world's maritime trade passes through the South China Sea. That's 5.3 trillion US dollars worth. So you'd think that this might have solved the problem of missing ship, but no, because AIS can be turned off. Captains were legitimately allowed to turn the transponder off when they feared attack by pirates or competitors. So the ship going dark, as you might say, is not necessarily an immediate cause for concern. Another problem is that the system could be hacked to give false locations. Now you might think that satellite camera technology, the eyes in the skies, could help if a ship suddenly went dark. But high-res photos from space are costly, typically $3,500 per image. And the governments and companies providing satellite images need several days' notice to aim at the precise spot required, by which time, of course, the vessel will be long gone. So if you can get aboard your target vessel, your first target on controlling the bridge is to control the radio and turn off AIS. Now you need paint, and possibly a welder, because the letters of a ship's name are often welded on, so you cut them off and paint on a new name. And change the registry. You will have already registered the name with a country of register. And today, of course, many countries, including landlocked ones like Mongolia or Bolivia, sell the right to fly their flag, a true flag of convenience, no questions asked. And you've brought all the relevant papers aboard with you, and you can now sail off into the sunset. Oh, there are a couple of other things to attend to. You've got to get rid of the existing crew, but as we've seen, they are expendable. Also, to ensure that there are no anomalies seen by any port officials or other agencies should they search the ship, you must remember to remove the shipbuilder's plates, especially those on the engines which are often forgotten. But how do you get aboard your target vessel? You may, of course, have put men aboard whilst the ship is in port, sign them on as regular crew. But even if you're to board at sea, 
you're only going to target loaded vessels, and with a full cargo, they sit low in the water, which is a great help. Of course, it's best to board at night, when you can bring your boat up to the ship's side, hopefully unnoticed. One ploy used on a number of occasions in these waters was to use two fishing boats that would position themselves on either side of the approaching ship that wouldn't notice that the fishing boats had a cable strung between them. The ship would pick up the cable with its bows and the boats would be dragged along and dragged in towards the ship, winding in the cables as they went till they were alongside. Given that a ship takes a long time to stop, even if a captain noticed what was happening, there was little he could do to stop it. Now, unless they used a method like this, poor fishermen can't afford the fast speedboats needed to specifically attack a ship, so modern-day piracy requires organisation and funds. It's believed that five or six gangs, organised crime syndicates linked to Chinese triads, are behind many of the attacks. Indonesian forces found one of these gangs operating from their very own mothership. Part 2. So, what about official connivance in piracy? Well, we've already seen how some countries issue flags of convenience which aid pirates, but let's look at indications of further involvement of authorities. In the same year as the Chung Son disappeared, the Louisa was off Malaysia bound for China with a cargo of 5,000 tonnes of palm oil, when 25 men with automatic weapons, dressed in army camouflage and on what looked like a Chinese navy boat, boarded the ship. They accused the ship's master of smuggling illegal aliens. They bound him and the crew. They changed the ship's name to Holly, hoisted a Panamanian flag and six days later they left with all they could carry. The International Maritime Bureau a non-profit-making organisation established in 1981 to act as a focal point in the fight against all types of maritime crime, was most alarmed. Five months previously, pirates had shipjacked MV Petro Ranger, bound for Ho Chi Minh City with a cargo of diesel and jet fuel. The armed, balaclava-led pirates boarded from a speedboat, beat up the Australian captain, Ken Blythe. His crew managed to get a message out to the Chinese authorities. The pirates were arrested, and amongst their belongings was official paperwork for a vessel called the Holly. Captain Blythe was questioned by the Chinese agencies, including the People's Liberation Army, who suggested quite forcibly that he'd made up the attack. And then they released the pirates, allowing them to go on to attack the Louisa. The IMB stated that this was a result either of inefficiency and infighting amongst inept Chinese authorities, or part of a deeper plot to cover up China's participation in criminal activity. We have evidence of collusion at the highest level, they said. While named and shamed, the Chinese authorities hanged several suspects. But it's not just whole ships that are pirated. Product tanker Galu Pusaka, sailing under the Indonesian flag, was found drifting unattended in the South China Sea in July 2014. The vessel is said to have been stripped of its equipment and suffered significant damage. The only cargo left aboard was a set of fresh provisions left in the ship's galley. And the Indonesian authorities believed that it had been operated as a mothership by pirates, transporting and siphoning stolen oil from other hijacked ships. The Indonesian authorities stumbled upon this abandoned tanker whilst engaged in a mission to track down yet another supposedly hijacked tanker, the Arsenal with which the owner lost all communications on June the 17th, offshore of Indonesia. May 2015, and the 3,000 deadweight tonne product tanker Oriental Glory was hijacked by a group of 30 pirates in six fishing vessels off a Malaysian island. The pirates then steamed the vessel 188 nautical miles northwest, where approximately 2,500 metric tonnes of the vessel's petroleum cargo was lighted via ship-to-ship transfer. And this was the second time the Oriental Glory had been hijacked by pirates. On the first occasion, on the 15th of July 2014, pirates siphoned off 1,600 metric tonnes of gas oil before releasing the ship the same day. And the same owners were targeted on the 1st of April 2015, when another of their vessels, the 6,500 deadweight tonne Dongfan Glory, was hijacked. The pirates lighted approximately 4,500 metric tonnes of gasoline on this occasion. 
This is believed to be one of the fishing boats used by those pirates, identified by the IMO, but no prosecutions have arisen from this. But it isn't only China that's involved. Pirates operate from all the countries bordering this sea, and there is, as yet, no sign of an end to such piracy.